Hello, I'm Troy Dietmeyer. I'm a field agronomist for Pioneer here in Northeast Iowa. Today is July 17th and just wanted to give you guys a little update on maybe what to be looking for out in your fields here this upcoming week. And I'm uh, going to start off here on soybeans. And if uh, the camera maybe wants to come in just a little bit closer here, uh, basically grabbed a soybean plant. This guy was planted about the middle of May. You can see that we have flowers working its way up the entire plant now. So we're at a uh, full R2 once we start to see flowers at the top of the plant. Um, I don't see any pods forming yet here at the bottom, but we're going to be pretty close because you can see these flowers are pretty much uh, done doing their thing. And so R3 is when we have pods three-fourths the way up the plant. And that's when we start thinking about doing our fungicide insecticide applications in soybeans. So we have probably a good maybe 10 days before we need to start getting too worried about that. Generally about the first week of August, it seems like year in, year out, is when we, when we do those uh, applications. Now a couple things to be looking for in the soybeans, uh, especially it seems like it's starting further south and working its way north, and that is uh, Japanese beetles and they've been doing quite a bit of defoliation in soybeans and this is kind of what you're going to see with Japanese beetles kind of if you will webbing or skeletalizing the leaf and generally the threshold for Japanese beetles is generally around 30 percent defoliation however this year being our soybeans are planted a little bit later as well as we're not closing our rows, we want to try to save as much of that leaf area as we can. So I'm going to tell you guys, if we start getting that 10-15% leaf defoliation at this stage of the summer, I'm going to want you to pull the trigger, go and use an insecticide and get rid of those Japanese beetles. Now they're pretty tough little creatures, so plan on pretty much killing what's in the field that day. And we don't have really good soil res or insect insecticide residual, I should say, when it comes to Japanese beetles. So those are kind of some of the things to be looking for in the soybeans. Um, if I can find some here, there is some leaf disease starting to come into the soybeans, and I found some plants here with what we call Septoria brown spot, and we got a le leaf here that does have some of them on. You can see right here at the bottom, you can see some of these brown spots right here. And that to me is looking like Septoria brown spot. Now sometimes uh, it can be confused for you guys out there as frog eye leaf spot. The frog eye leaf spot will get quite a bit bigger and will also have a light tannish uh, interior. So Septoria brown spot, generally smaller brown all the way through the lesion, whereas the frog eye leaf spot's gonna have some white tan in the center of it. So just starting to see those soybean diseases show up, not too nervous about them yet. And like I said, here in about 10 days, maybe when we come in and do our traditional fungicide insecticide application, um, these diseases will probably be going just a little bit stronger. Now on the corn side, uh, there's a couple things going on. Obviously, we're getting very close to pollination along Highway 20. There'll be a lot of corn pollinating here this week. Uh, fortunately, we did get quite a bit of rainfall throughout scattered areas. During pollination, we generally use two to three tenths of an inch of water a day, so it can uh, really add up in a hurry. So it's good that we did catch some of those recent rainstorms. Um, one of the things, got a nice little draft there. One of the things that we have been seeing uh, here in Northeast Iowa again is areas of very heavy corn rootworm feeding. And if the camera would want to come in, I'll show you some roots uh, with some varying degrees of damage. And one of the things that we're looking for obviously is roots that are pruned off, especially to within a couple inches of, of, the, of the main stalk. And this guy here wasn't in too bad a shape. You can see we do have some that were pruned back right here, uh, browning and uh, things like that. You can see that this guy was cut off right here and uh, pretty well got taken out. Now, especially in dry conditions, all we need is about three of these roots to actually start to lose yield. So I really encourage you guys to get out there right now and uh, dig some roots and see what things are looking like. And and we'll just kind of see uh, how things go. Uh, if you need help scoring, be sure to call your local Pioneer sales rep. Here's obviously some uh, roots that have had significant rootworm feeding, and just want to make sure you guys get out there. We need to know what our corn rootworm populations are out in our corn fields, and we, can't, we cannot just rely on the trait anymore, and obviously anytime you start seeing whole nodes of roots ate off, we have to change management. And one of the things, that we can start to do 
when you look at managing corn rootworms, and that is sticky traps. We're going to start putting sticky traps out here this Wednesday. Um, and really encourage you guys to talk to your Pioneer sales rep. What sticky traps will do is allow us to see how many beetles are flying around in our field and therefore assess the risks for the next coming year. And go, go hold, get a hold of your local Pioneer sales rep and uh, talk to them about getting sticky traps out in your field. Because like I said, we need to start implementing other practices besides just relying on the trait, such as sticky traps, which allow us to do a good job of what some people call beetle bombing or adult management. And we also need to think about using soil applied insecticides on our planter, as well as rotating the soybeans. One final thing, just kind of as a food for thought, we have had some storms here recently in uh, northeast Iowa, some gooseneck corn, and a lot of times what that'll do is that'll trick the corn plant into not setting out the primary ear and maybe using a secondary ear further down the line. So I just recently took this plant off. It did break on me, but right there was the soil layer or soil surface, and then this was the plant. So we have about one to one and a half leaves left around the tassel, so it'll be pollinating here this week. But what's interesting is, and sometimes what'll happen is every time we stress the plant significantly, uh, it'll actually lower what node it's going to put a leaf out on. And a lot of times we can get six, seven different nodes that'll have uh, ears on it. I'm sorry, I think I said leaves, but every time we stress the plant, it'll lower a node on which primary, on which ear it's going to actually develop and, and put to grain. So as you can see, this, this plant right here, this is the guy that's going to be coming out. Uh, but if we would have been stressed, you know, here's the ear, here's a potential ear, here's a potential ear, there's a potential ear, there's another one, there's another one, there's a little guy right there, and finally that little guy right there just barely above the soil surface. So corn plants are really resilient, so I guess my point is to those of you that may have had some lodging here over the past week or two, uh, the corn plant generally, if you can give it a week, 10 days before it pollinates to kind of upright itself, and re recover from the stress, we should do pretty good. So if you guys have any questions, be sure to contact your local Pioneer sales representative and we'll see you in the fields. Thank you.